through our study, through um, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11. So open your Bibles, if you have a Bible with you this morning, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 11, and if you do not have a Bible with you, then uh, raise your hand, because we'd love to have you follow along with us as we go through, beginning at verse 14 this morning. So Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 14. As you're turning there, just a very, very quick recap of the first part of chapter 11 prior to this portion of scripture that we're going to get into today. Um, Jesus has been teaching his disciples, we know, all along. And this particular portion of scripture is the second time that Jesus teaches his disciples on how to pray. Did it earlier on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthews 5, 6, and 7. And he does it again this time. This is the only time the, the disciples have ever asked, Lord, train us. Train us up in something that is valuable. And they found that by the example of their teacher, that prayer seemed to be a pretty important thing. Jesus then teaches his two disciples in these first 13 verses two things. One is he gives them a passion for prayer. A passion for prayer. He teaches them how they are to be passionate for prayer. And how you and I are also to be passionate for prayer. To have a, a passionate prayer life. To go to the Lord. To, to want to go to Him. To speak to Him. To commune with Him. To have that one-on-one -on -one koinonia as it would. Between you and the Lord. You must have. Uh, you know... If you don't have a prayer life, then I really don't know how you're hearing from God. Because you can't. It's going to be impossible. Can I say it again with more emphasis? Impossible for you to hear from the Lord if you don't have a prayer life. You must have one. That's the time that God speaks to you and to me during whatever time. Whether it's times are going great, woohoo, everything's wonderful, or maybe things aren't so sweet, things aren't so good, you need to go to the Lord in prayer. And he gave us identification through this, the model prayer, or this prayer, that on how we're to pray, the position of where we're at, the provision of where, what God gives us, the, the promises that he gives us, and also the protection of which he gives us. So when we pray, Jesus says, pray like this. You don't have to pray this exact prayer. It's not what Jesus is saying. But he's given them an example on how to pray. And so we have to understand positionally who we're speaking to. God's in heaven and we're here on earth. Provisionally, that he is going to give us our daily bread. So if you need something that he knows is good for you, if you're in a situation to where, you know, uh, you need physical uh, sustenance of some sort, um, he will provide also the bread of his word. I mean, man does not live by bread alone, but by the word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Jesus said to the devil in the in the desert, so you know what? The Word of God, that bread, that manna for you every day. In fact, there's a little book that we have in the foyer that's free, and you all know about it. It's called the Daily Bread, is it not? Hey, it's, a, it's, it's sustenance for you. It's nutrition for you. And then the other area that he taught on as well in that model prayer was not only uh, position and provision, but also the promise the promise that he had, that he will forgive us. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that he will forgive us if we ask, and then he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness in 1 John 1, 9. So there's a promise from God, a forgiveness of our sins. You and I, although we're sinners saved by grace, we know where the meal is, we know where the bread is, we're beggars really, but we know exactly where to get the bread of life, that he will be faithful to forgive you if you are sincere. If you are sincere and you repent, He will be faithful to forgive you. And not only that, but He will cleanse you. 
Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's so awesome. The fourth thing in that model prayer is, is his protection. You know, delivering us from evil. The evil one, Satan himself. So he gives us that way to pray. Again, you don't have to pray. It's not that Jesus is saying pray exactly these words. I know growing up in, as a Catholic myself, there, are, there is this, this prayer that, that I prayed all the time. But I didn't know what it meant growing up. I didn't understand the purpose of it. I pray that you understand today, and as we've been going through this, the purpose and the reason why Jesus said it this way for those four reasons. The second thing. So the first thing, he wants to give you a passion. You must have a passion for prayer. The second thing is, is a persistence in prayer. You must be persistent in prayer. It's not that you're going to get everything you want, but you're going to receive that of which the Father believes is beneficial for you and good for you. He's going to provide that. That's part of His provision, part of His promise. But you have to be persistent in prayer. Not as if you're trying to change the mind of God. And not as if, like, you're a little lap dog begging, 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 and he's like, okay, here's a, here's a biscuit, now I'll give you what you want. He's not, it's not like that at all. Our, our Father does not operate that way. But I believe the reason that He wants us to be persistent in prayer is for the reason that through that persistence, it helps us ourselves understand what we're actually asking for. You ever done that? I mean, our kids do that, huh? When they were little and Christmas is coming or birthday's coming. Oh, mommy, oh, daddy, I want this, I want this. And at that moment, at that instant, it's the only thing they want. It's all they want. I remember growing up, all I wanted was, well, it was, at the time it was Tonkas. They still make Tonka toys? Okay, there was a Tonka truck, and it was this big loader, this big dump truck, and we lived on a hill, and I thought and got the idea, wow, I was small enough at the time to where I could probably get on that dump truck and ride down the hill, and I thought, you know, that would be really cool. I really, really, really want that. Well, I didn't get that because that's not really what I wanted. I ended up changing my mind. I ended up like... The next commercial came out, and there was a, a better thing that I wanted. There was something else that I wanted. Oh, no, I want that Stingray bike. They still make Stingray bikes, Schwinn's. All right, a Stingray bike, because I wanted to do some little bicycle motocross, you know. And so that was, that was then the next thing. So I do firmly believe that the persistence in prayer helps you and me kind of filter out the stuff. The stuff that we think we want, yet we find out later after praying and asking and seeking and knocking, oh, maybe that's just not the better thing for me. See, that's why many times God will just wait. If you had a prayer and it's like, Lord, you haven't answered the prayer yet. Well, examine your prayer. Examine what you're praying for. Maybe, maybe... He wants you to reevaluate that. So, passion for prayer, persistence in prayer. Very important. That's what Jesus has taught us in the first 13 verses. Now, let's start with verse 14. It begins like this, and he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke, and the multitudes were marveled. I'm going to read all the way to verse 22 here. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. Verse 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom, is divided, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falls. Verse 18. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will, you, how will his kingdom stand? Good question. Because I say, because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. 
And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Verse 20. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace and goods are in peace, But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. Interesting portion of Scripture, I think. Jesus has come upon this particular individual who is possessed by a demon. Now know this and be comforted by this, that you, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I don't mean just walking forward and saying a prayer, but you are truly demonstrating the life of a saved person, a a saved child of God, actually demonstrating it in your life, actually showing those attributes, then you're saved. Because how can we say that we have God and not do the things that God instructs us? We call the Lord then a liar. We have to be, if we are saved, be demonstrating those fruits in our lives outwardly. It's got to happen. So here we see that this individual, this man is being, has been, we don't know for how long, has been taken over by a demon. And what happens now in that account is that those others, there are others that begin now to question it. And they question it in the fashion to where they're saying, wait a minute, here you expelled this demon But you did it by and through the power of Satan, Beelzebub. There's a whole issue about how that name came about, mixing with Baal and and another uh, conjunctive type type word. The Hebrews made it into to uh, really show that it meant the devil, Satan himself. And so they're, they're accusing Jesus of using the power of Satan to cast out demons. His accusers, they come from the crowd, much like you here. A crowd of people. They see the miracle. They observe the demon leaving the man because it tells us in the scripture that this was a a mute demon. And this mute demon also in taking over this man, the man could not speak either. He was also mute because the scriptures declare that once the the demon was expelled, the man then begins to speak. That's what they were marveled at. That's what amazed them. Well, they come from the crowd, and the accusers are are Pharisees, of course. You know, those good old Pharisees, always around when you need them, huh? When Jesus is doing something, there they are, always following him, always trying to test him, always trying to trip him up and to trap him in something. There they are, because Matthew and Mark declare this similar event or possibly the same event to where they're alluding to the fact that these were Pharisees who came up with the accusations. The scripture tells us in verse 15, but some of them said, he, he casts out demons by Beelzebub. They're whispering. They're whispering, and that's why in the next verse, well, actually in 17, it says, but he knowing their thoughts. See, they're whispering, they're murmuring in in, in a low, low voice. And what happens is, is everyone else then begins to doubt. Everybody begins to doubt and say, hey, yeah, maybe so. Maybe this guy, Jesus, is truly... Casting out demons by Satan. Well, there's something definitely wrong with that 
equation, I think. Some wanted to accuse Jesus and others then want a sign saying, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, if in fact you cast out demons not of Satan, then bring us a sign from heaven. Show us a sign. As if all the healings beforehand and all the miracles beforehand were not proof enough, they say, give me a sign. The irony of it all is, is that no matter how much Jesus did, nor does, people still don't believe. Isn't that true? How many of you, before you came to Jesus Christ, saw workings in people's life, yet you still held back? How many of you might have been raised up in church and then deviated from the things of God? Backslidden, as it were. And then you come back to the things of the Lord. You see, signs were still not enough for even you or me to come to Christ. To see the sign of an incredibly transformed life. A life that has been that was in the miry clay and muck and then the gutter or hooked on drugs or hooked on alcohol or hooked on something or just dealing with prideful issues or just, just maybe just not a really nice person filled with hate, filled with animosity, filled with anger. You ever known anybody like that? Don't show me your hands, but all of us kind of know someone in our lives. And maybe that person has come to Christ and yet still that very thing did not convince you. A sign. A sign doesn't matter. Jesus did many signs. That's the irony of it all. Give us a sign, Lord. Give us a sign, Jesus, from heaven. Then we will believe. Are you looking for signs in your Christian walk? Are you always looking for signs from the Lord? Waiting for a sign to do something. Waiting for a sign to confirm something. Signs won't convince you. Signs will not change you. I guarantee it. Well, in 17 and 18... Jesus then makes his statement. And he speaks about a kingdom being divided against itself. That it will be brought down. It will be brought to desolation. And speaking about a house. If it too is divided against itself. It too is destined for separation. For falling. For destruction. Listen. If Jesus were driving out demons by Satan then the answer would be that Satan is against Satan. True? That's how it would read. That's how it would have to be. If he was expelling and casting out demons in the name of Satan, one of Satan's own demons, it's Satan eliminating his own work, his own guys, his own soldiers. And if that were the case, it would be kind of like a civil war, I thought. You know, a civil war to where within that kingdom they're fighting, the same forces are fighting against one another. We had a civil war not far from these places of where we live today, many years ago. They were within the same country, the same nation, yet the same people fighting against one another. That's what a civil war is all about. Nothing actually civil about it when you think about it, but this would be a civil war in the kingdom of Satan, would it not? And if that were the case, then the answer still would be that Satan is against himself. Satan is against himself. Understand this, guys. No king would throw out his own soldiers from the kingdom. Doesn't happen that way. No military branch would allow the the navy to go after the marines or the army to go after the navy. It makes no sense. They're on the same side. 
You understand what I'm saying? And so neither would Satan then throw his demons out of a person that they had possessed. Jesus knows by that accusation and really a pretty stupid thought that there's no way that the kingdom would be able to stand against itself. It could never stand against itself. In verses 19 through 20, Jesus then, in that word sons, in verse 19, that word is is translated, and in the context, it really is meaning um, the others. Because he's speaking to those Pharisees, and they then have other junior Pharisees or fellow Pharisees, who have also, understand, because this goes way back to where even the Pharisees and even those were also casting out demons in the name of God. So it's obvious here that he's speaking about these other Pharisees being the sons, saying, hey, go ask your other sons, go ask your other fellow Pharisees. Are they casting out demons in the name of Satan? Well, the answer would be, of course not. They're not doing that. Go ask them and let them tell you how they cast out demons and find out if they were in fact working for Satan or not. But Jesus then says, if it isn't by the power of Satan, whoa, if it's not that caused those demons to leave, then it must be by the power of God. I want you to notice in verse 20, Those three words, finger of God. First, Jesus says, but if I cast out demons with the finger of God. Know this, it's not as if Jesus was going to. That word translated in the original language is since. So just replace it there. But since I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. So he is declaring that anything that he does is of the power of God. Think about the things in your life. Think about those things that have trapped you. Those things that have held you back. Those so-called demons. Those things that keep you separated from the Lord. It is only by the power of God that He will save you. It is only by the power of God, the finger of God, that He will show you, give you the power to overcome whatever's going on in your life. It is only by the power of God that these things can be done. No self-help program, no 12 easy steps to get a new life, no Dr. Phil First year series and second year series of CDs can help you. No Oprah Winfrey television network or the help network or whatever network is going to help you. It's not. Only the power of God. If you're a believer, you see, it's only the power of God. Otherwise, it's all yourself. What do you think they call it? Self-help. Hmm, hello, self-help. You're helping yourself. Wow, how many times have you tried to help yourself and that's gone really well? It hasn't, has it? It's amazing, I believe, the power of God. Jesus doesn't have to say, I want the arm of God to come down and cast out this demon. Oh, I want the the right hand of the Father to to give me power to, to cast out this demon. He doesn't say that. Just the finger of God. Pretty cool, huh? The power, the power of God. In verses 21 and 22, Jesus then speaks of the superiority he has. The superiority of God. That understand this, Satan has no match for. Satan is not evenly matched with God. When you think of Satan, understand this, practical application here for you. When you think of Satan, don't think of him as opposite of God. It's God, it's Satan. Satan, it's God. Arch rivals. Are you kidding me? I mean, really. 
If you think that, your theology is pretty much off base. The reason why, think about who Satan really is. Just a fallen angel. So the Bible declares he is no deity. He's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He's none of those things. He's not all powerful. He's just an angel that has fallen. It's all he is. There is no comparison to God and Satan. None whatsoever. About the only comparison in equal would be probably the archangel, archangels Gabriel and Michael. They're angels. And we know that there's struggle that goes on uh, between the, the archangels and Satan. So, if you want to do a comparison, well, that's the only comparison that's biblically accurate. Not God. The finger of God, just the finger. It's probably the little finger of God. That is oh so much more powerful. Imagine everything. Can you imagine that? The full power of God on something. Man, if the finger of God can do something incredible like that, the power is contained in this little finger. Wow. Imagine. You see, and even in spite of God being so incredibly better and greater and more powerful than Satan, even the archangels, wow, even they have victory over Satan. Jesus says that if God has done the casting out, this casting out, then a stronger than Satan overcomes him. And that's what's meant in verse 20. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Then he goes into 20 and and 21 and 22 is where he speaks about the strong man, a stronghold, guards his own palace, everything's in peace. But the stronger than he, the stronger than he, who is the stronger than he? God. God is the stronger one. He's the one who overcomes. He's the one who gives victory. Stronger is he, the Lord, that overcomes Satan. It's Jesus. It is only the name of Jesus, the Bible says, that you will be saved. By His name. Only by His name that you will be saved. The, when, when, when Jesus comes in who is stronger, the armor of Satan is taken away. He being the stronger one now is on the scene. In fact, in your own reading, read Colossians chapter 2. In your own reading, that tells us how defeated Satan is. How humiliated Satan is when Jesus is on the cross. We call it the humiliation of Christ. The old days they called it that. Meaning the sufferings of him. But man, there was no humiliation truly. I believe. Man, it was a direct in your face, Lucifer. In your face, man. I am, I am here. I'm going to be going up on this cross. I am going to be the redeemer. And nothing can stop me. Nothing. Amen? Satan's power at that time, even by being on the cross, that moment Jesus was lifted on the cross, his power was stripped. His power is done. Please don't think that Jesus... Or God the Father actually wrestles with Satan. Then maybe some of you say, okay, well, gee, Pastor Tom, then why does Satan seem so doggone powerful? Why does he seem to always be messing with my life? Why does he always seem to be stirring the pot? It sure seems like he's powerful. Well, just look at how he does business. How does Satan do business? Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 tells us that he's what? The accuser of the brethren. Just one of his many little tactics. Accusations. 
He accuses you of something every single day and every single night of which you might have done. Let's say you sinned. Let's say you transgressed. And let's say you've even gone to the foot of the cross and you understand the grace of God. And you've said, Lord, I'm repentant. Lord, deliver me from this sin. Protect me from it. Keep my eyes away from it. Lord, wash me. And you go back to 1 John 1, 9. You say, yes, I have asked for forgiveness. He's forgiven me. Now, yes, he's going to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. All that said and done is good and well. But how does Satan work? How does he work? Even after you go to the cross, even after you lay it down before Jesus, and unless you firmly, firmly with all, just everything of yourself, unless you truly, truly believe it and know it, by knowing Jesus, you believe it, then, as he accuses you day and night of what you did, He whispers into your ear. He whispers into my ear. It's like those old cartoons, Bugs Bunny cartoons, right? You see the little devil on one side, and you see the angel on the other, and it's like, you know, once it's the same thing. It's whispering right into your ear. He's accusing you. Ah, you you don't read your Bible enough. Ah, you don't go to church enough. You don't tithe. You don't pray. You're always angry at your wife. You never respect your husband. Your children are just, whoo, out. He accuses you. You aren't doing a good enough job. What kind of a parent are you? What kind of a Christian are you? You're all messed up, aren't you? Woo, you guys. That's what the enemy says. That's what the devil says. Now, you all may be pretty messed up. I am. You know, I mean, let's call it like it is. We are pretty messed up. But by the grace of God, I'm regenerated. I'm renewed. You see, and and the enemy is going to continue to, like, thinking of like in the military you know you got the ships that are sitting way offshore can't even be touched by anything from the land yet they have the ability to shoot these things called missiles or bombs am i right john those things these caliber things that they shoot off from these big cannons and they continue getting from his little demons, they continue saying, oh yeah, I know what's up with Tom. I know what he's done. And so now, now, hey man, boss man, go ahead. Here's the coordinates. Hit him. Hit him. Send in those, those long-range missiles. And I'm going, where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? Why is this happening to me? Well, First off, do we think we're so special that things won't happen to us? Secondly, Satan's way out there. He's way out there. And he's throwing these little bombs because his guys are giving him the coordinates. And it's the bombs of accusation after accusation after accusation. Now, I'll caveat this with the fact that if you do examine yourself and there are things in your life that you need to get in order, then get them in order then get them in order. But Satan just wants to accuse the brethren. And then what happens? What happens to you then and me? You start believing it, don't you? You start believing the lie. You start believing the fact that you are no good. You start believing the fact that you are a a bad parent or a bad husband, a bad wife, a a bad father, bad mother, whatever it might be, a bad Christian. Oh, I'm such a terrible Christian, man. When am I going to get my act right? You know, in fact, yeah, I am so bad. I'm so bad. I'm really bad. So why do I even need to come to church? I'm so bad. I'm so bad. No one will talk to me because I'm so bad. I'm so wretched. I'm just messed up. So why do I even want to come to church now? Forget that. I'm not going to pray. 
Why do I want to pray for? God's not going to listen to my prayers because I'm such a bad person. You start believing the accusations. You start believing the lies. You say, I'm no good. And he's right. Colossians 2 tells me that all sin has been taken out. Taken out of the way. It's been nailed to the cross. And Satan is defeated. The finger of God, his grace and his power, the message of the cross, that's the answer. That's the answer. If you have a hurting wife or a hurting husband, a hurting son, a hurting daughter, listen up. Don't let guilt bind them. Don't allow it. Don't let guilt bind them because you and I are called to be ministers and we're called to minister to one another. And in that, it's the finger of God that reconciles. It's His finger, it's His power that reconciles. What about Jesus? You remember the account of the woman caught in adultery? In the very act, she's brought before the leaders of the city and they bring them to Jesus, they bring her to Jesus. There they are ready to stone her. Jesus begins writing something on the ground, doesn't he? Something on the ground. Some say it might have been the sins of those men who were holding the stones. Others say it might have been the Ten Commandments. But no one knows. So whatever Jesus is writing with his finger, remember, he's God. And he's using that finger, that power. And it is by that that he's able to tell this woman who was caught in sexual immorality, right in the very act, he's able to say, your sins are forgiven. Go sin no more. That's the power of God. And that is the capability of His power in the life of a person that is caught up in sin of some nature. You and I are ministers of the gospel of grace, the gospel of holiness and love. And if there is someone that you know that is beating themselves up for guilt and condemnation, well, first off, they're forgetting the one scripture that says there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. There's, there's no condemnation for, for us. But we believe the enemy, don't we? We start believing his accusations, don't we? If you see that happening in a person's life, you're called to minister to them. You're called to minister. That means you've got to minister to them. Don't shy away from it. And if you are in a time and a place to where you need ministering to, a tough time, you're beating yourself up, then you need to get ministered. You cannot hold it all to yourself. You cannot say, I'm just going to deal with this on my own and not reach out to a brother or a sister in the Lord to receive the ministering hand, the ministering finger of Jesus Christ. Verse 23, whoa, he says this. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Well, you can't be neutral, Jesus says. Eh, sorry, no neutrality when it comes to me, he says. You can't be in the middle, cruising in neutral. In the area of spiritual warfare especially, you are either in the way of the cross or you are an enemy of the cross. That's what Jesus is saying. 
It's one way or the other. Either you're in the way of the cross or you're an enemy of the cross. That's how Jesus sees it. Verses 24 through 26. When the unclean spirit does come out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. How nice, huh? Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. They enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is what? Worse. Oh, worse than the first. So Jesus gives us a parable here. Another parable on a, on a, on a man, an unbeliever, because this man has the spirit in him, this demon in him. Notice the demon is not cast out in verse 24. It just says the spirit goes out of the man. For whatever reason, this one spirit in the parable says, boop, he just left. No problem. He's just gone. He's gone for a while. Then he and his seven other buddies, they notice that this guy, this person, man or woman, who had him in her or him, wow, everything looks kind of cleaned up. The house is swept. It looks really nice. I think... We're going to go back. Come on, guys, there's plenty of room, a lot of rooms in that house. Let's go. Worse than before, more wicked than he, that first demon. What does that say? What's Jesus saying? Listen, remember what we're talking about here. We're talking about spiritual warfare. That's the context of the scripture. Demons, the devil, and Jesus casting them out. He being Strong, but yet Jesus stronger. He carries the same thought and says, listen, if you do not have Christ, guess what? And this demon leaves you, and you don't then fill yourself with the things of me, he says, about himself. If you don't fill it back up with the things of God, those demons are going to come back. Worse than before. Applicationally for you and for me, God delivers you and me of something. You must replace it even more so with the things of God. You must. Otherwise, something of the world will come in and be that replacement. Verses 29 through 32, or I'm sorry, 27 and 28. And it happened as he spoke these things, a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. But he, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God. The woman is insightful, but she doesn't understand the message of Jesus. It's not just who she sees as far as Jesus. But he says, listen, I want them to hear the message. I want them to hear my message. It's not about me. It's about the message that I bring. And so he says, I want you to hear it, and I want you to keep it. Do it. Keep that message. 29 through 32, And while the crowds were thickly gathered, he began to say, This evil generation, it seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign... To the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up in judgment with the men in the, of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. 32. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented and the, at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Here, wow, Jesus sees the crowds. He knows they want a sign. They're seeking a sign. But we said signs don't produce anything, really. After he admonishes the crowd to be hearers, to follow him, they still want to see a sign. They want to see some kind of miracle go before them. Jesus then brings up, Old Testament, and he says, listen, remember the queen of Sheba. Did she not travel from far to come to hear the wisdom and the word of Solomon? Oh, let's take it a a stretch further. Do you remember Jonah? 
Jonah was called by God, sent by God to go minister to a people, a heathen people. And guess what? Even they heard and they repented. Wow. Just by hearing the word. So he gives them that Old Testament example. See, that's what the word of God does, guys, or it should do to your life. Whenever you and I open up the scriptures, when you open up this thing on your lap called the Bible, when you open it up, understand you're going to be confronted with Jesus. Do you hear me? You're confronted with Jesus. Everything He wants of you Everything He wants for you, everything that He will do in your life is here. Expect confrontation. Oh, I don't know if I like that scripture. Woo, I like all the others in that chapter, but that one, no way. How many of us do that? When you open up the scriptures... Every time, be ready to be confronted with His teachings. Let His words pierce your heart, pierce your soul. So why? Why? So that you can be transformed. That's the idea. If you never pick up your Bible and you're living off the coattails of your spouse or family or relatives or lineage or whatever you do, I don't know, but if you're living off of those coattails, you are never going to be transformed. Understand me. It's by the Word of God as you read it, through the Spirit of God as He speaks to you, because how do you know when God's talking to you unless you're familiar with His Word? word that's his voice amen that's his voice you got to learn his voice you got to learn his voice In closing verse 33 through 36 no one when he has a lit lamp puts it under a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who may come in and see, operative word, guys, see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full. Your body also is full of darkness. I don't know. I don't know. That didn't sound right. Let me read that right. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Verse 35, therefore take heed. He says, beware, caution, that the light which is in you is not darkness. So he speaks about something being in you, a light in you, that could be darkness. Interesting. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part of dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. What a great analogy. What a great picture we see. A light, light, light and a lampstand. Jesus exhorts the crowds and the, each person to focus their eyes on the light. Jesus. All who focuses their eyes on His teachings and on Jesus, they will be transformed by absorbing that light in them. That's the transformation. When you read this book... When you apply its precepts, its commands in your life, that is the light that comes in. Do you understand? And as he who is stronger than Satan, those things, then the light will then begin burning up all those other things in your life, and those other things will disappear, and then what's going to happen is there'll be more light kind of makes sense reading his word the lamp is the message of Jesus the light is the truth of his word 
the whole body that is full of light, Jesus says, will have no part with darkness. No part. What kind of things do we do in our private secret places? And I'm not specifically talking about maybe a location physically, but how about our minds? Sometimes we dwell upon, well, the computer, pornography, different things like that, physical things, but what about the mental? What about the things in our mind? I can be perfectly sitting here in church like you all here and my mind just be wondering about totally wrong things. Other than the fact is when is Pastor Tom going to finish? That's bad. No. But seriously, it can be the physical location, that dark place a place behind closed doors, a place to where truly the character of Christ should be the very thing that is above all else because no one is watching, but someone is watching. Remember, you have an audience of one always. That audience of one, is his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. What's your character like? Is your body full of light? Or are there still dark recesses within that you're not allowing the light to break through, to come in? Paul says, examine yourself, children. Examine. Take that microscope spiritually and look. Look at your life. Because the Bible declares, and I believe it, where there is light, there is no darkness. That where there is light, darkness cannot dwell. See, that's what the Bible promises, and I, I believe it. My encouragement to you is switch on the light. <laughs> Just like a light here in this room, it's so easy. Bing, it switches on, and we get light. Switch on the light of Jesus in your life. By God's word, it will guide you, it will direct you, and it will show you, and it will keep you on that narrow road. As the Bible says, to follow Jesus, it's a narrow gate and a difficult or narrow road. The idea is, is when you go off that narrow road, because of your relationship with God, with Jesus, he brings you back in. That's what he does. That's what he does. But if you're living a life on the broad road, oh man, be careful. Be careful. There is no one, no one that cares. Absolutely no one. But if you're on that narrow road, and yeah, we get off the road sometimes. Yeah, we kind of take a little detour, but we're near that narrow road to where we allow the Lord to say, come on back, come on back. I love you, and I want these wonderful things for you, so come on back, child, come on back. And it's like, wow. If you've already tuned me out, well, it's your loss. Because, because, This is the word of life. This is the word of life. If you seek life, read your Bible. Know the Father's voice. Know Him intimately. This is the light. Because without it, oh man, we can become pretty dark, can't we? Inside. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, it is refreshing, to say the least. And Lord, it is challenging.
And Lord, when you say in your scripture here, God, that we are to be blessed, of course, but we are to keep it, that being your word. And that if we're not with you, we're against you. Those are from your lips, Lord. Those, that's from what you say. And so, Lord, we don't want to be scattered, but we want to be close to the vine. And so, Lord, this morning, I pray if there's anyone here, God, if there's anyone here who has drifted off the narrow road, that by your loving hand, by your grace, you will usher them back onto that road, knowing that there is no condemnation, knowing that truly the accuser of the brethren, Satan, will do his accusing. He will do his job. So, Lord, may we be strong. May we listen to your words. May we abide by your spirit. And Lord, may the light of Christ shine brightly in our lives. May we be a beacon on a hill. May we be that light that demonstrates Jesus. It's in your name. All God's people agree by saying, amen. Amen, guys. If there's any of you that need prayer this morning, please come up and be prayed for. There'll be leaders up.